Praise the Lord. Well, that woke you up, didn't it? Amen. Could I have my slide there, please, Ray? Um, I, w- I, w- I want to emphasize what Pastor Simeon was, was saying there about the women next Saturday. You know what, LFC? Are you listening to me? Eyes forward. We have to change our behavior in terms of timekeeping. <laughs> we have to change our behavior in terms of timekeeping because the church is changing Schedules are changing, and if you don't change with them, this church is going to leave you behind. Okay? So there's many, many meetings coming about around the city, etc., but some of them will be in this building. So you're going to have to start coming on time. Next Saturday, the meeting starts at what time? I've had three different times. Okay, get here for 3.30, it starts at 4, but there's a Brazilian service coming in around 6, so we've got to be out of here by 6. So if you come at 5 o'clock, which is very typical, right? That's not going to work anymore. The meeting will start, be here for half 3, it will start at 4, and will be done by about 6. But please do come. It's an important time. I want to update you about a few of the regions and what's happening around the city. The Ethiopians, most of you have met Pastor Andy. He's working at the moment in Canada Water. We have this hall. In fact, we have this hall. And we've got another hole beneath it. We've got two holes there. The hole beneath it is empty at the moment. So that's something that's available for us from this point on. It's already paid for. It's available. He pays for that, by the way. So this is happening every Saturday between 3 and 6. Very quickly, we're almost already full here in this building. We need to access other buildings around the city. This is the first one, Bermondsey area. Saturday 3 till 6. So just keep it in mind, if you have functions on that day, at that time, this is available for us. Bless him, he's doing a great job. He also has another building coming up. It will be our other only, the only other Sunday building. And it will be in Shepherd's Bush. So we're working on that at the moment. Next slide, please. Thanks. The Russians, this is where I was last Sunday. The Russians have been meeting in Golders Green in this church, the Methodist church. These people have been very kind to us. I think most of you have met Pastor Eugene. So this is the hall that we have. We have this hall on my memory. We have this hall on Sundays from 3 o'clock till 6 o'clock on Sundays. So that's a really good opportunity. We also, because... Eugene's a Methodist minister. He's just come out from under them and come under us. So he has access to this facility. That's going to become very important for us. So, for example, there's a lot of Filipinos here. A lot. And that would be a great place, Ferlin, for you to keep in mind for the future, Edgar. This is a location we could really reach that community. Next slide. Praise the Lord for the Portuguese. The, the Brazilians were in last night. Fantastic bunch of people. This, there are five Portuguese nations. So this is an important group. Very effective group. Very well trained professional pastors. Actually, I'm, I'm impressed. They have a lot of work to do, but I really get the gut feeling they're capable of it. So they'll be in here every Saturday and Thursday night and other nights doing their various ministry meetings just like we do. And eventually, once the time is right, we'll begin to pull ourselves together. But let me just do my homework first. Next slide. Praise the Lord for Armenia. Uh, The Armenians are coming around about January. This is Pastor Artem. I've known him a long time. And he's doing research right now to link us in with the Armenian community around London. And he'll come here in a prepared state in and around January, and we'll kick off that group. That's a sizable group also. Next slide, please. The Romanians are coming. So probably around September time, you'll meet this guy. I've known him a long time. I brought him into ministry myself, actually, years ago. I met him. He was a painter decorator, and he became the pastor of the church, Romanian church in Dublin. I guess it's about 15 years ago, 12, 15 years ago, something like that, and he's still the pastor now. Very, very, very nice guy. Worship leader of the highest order. He's, he's a lovely person. So he has had a dream to reach the Romanians in London for a long time. Spoke to me about it many times. I wish I could come and do this. 
So this is his opportunity. You'll meet him in September. Last slide, I think. Is that right? Pakistanis. This is, this is a great guy, actually. This is a, an evangelist called Noman Kenneth. Came to the Lord in Glasgow some time ago. Trained in street ministry. And is a very effective street preacher. I took this picture on Friday in Leicester Square. Because he preaches there on a regular basis. And what I, he showed me what he was doing, where he does it, etc., etc. He's a bit of an expert in apologetics. And by, I don't mean in-house, I mean on the street. He's really good at just standing up on a soapbox and pulling a crowd, and he can handle it. It's not easy. He's really, really good at that. So I've asked him, he's in Portugal at the moment, but I've asked him how would he agree to work with us and help us to reach particularly the Pakistani community, because it's difficult. That's a tough bunch of people, and I want to break through with them. When he's preaching on the street, those, he attra- I mean, you attract what you are. You attract what you are. As soon as the Indians or Bangladeshis see him, they stop, and they think, what are you doing? Muslim man, right? <laughs> you know? And he says, no. And that is a real good draw. So I, I really hope that we can pull him in. There are other things as well with the other language groups which we'll inform you of later. But please, none of this can work if we don't keep good timing. We've got to improve our timing. So please remember that. It's part of our growth, part of our future. Thank you. Let's stand, if you would, with me and pray for the word this morning. If you could turn off the projector, Ray, please. Hallelujah. Just think of yourself for one moment. We're going to be continuing our series as we look at releasing the dream and being empowered for God to take you forward in what you were born for. And if you have missed that point, if you have missed that calling, that purpose, then today I want you to reconnect with it. It is not too late. So you just pray. You pray your own private secret prayer right now. Ask God to prophesy into your life today, here, this morning. Speak to me, God. Guide me, God. Lead me, God. Hallelujah. Now that we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. So this is week Five, actually, in terms, or message five, in terms of a series we're doing about every one of you, without exception, entering into the purpose for which God created you. He had a dream in his mind. He had a purpose in his heart. He knows what it is, but very often, maybe we have a sneaky suspicion that God's got something for us, you know, but life can cloud it or other people can dampen it. And I want you to find it. The first message was about closing the door on the past. That's a critical step. Then we talked about releasing the dream that is within us, actually finding what it is, realizing that, sanctifying that. And today I want to talk about taking the first step towards your dream, actually doing something, taking the first move. You know what, guys? I've told you many times, I come from a big family. I have nine brothers and sisters. Eyes forward, please. Give me your attention. I have nine brothers and sisters. One of my sisters has lived on the same street for, what is she? Nearly 60. She's lived in the same two square miles for 60 years. She doesn't like planes. So she's never been anywhere. Same little street, tiny little world, and do you know what? She's happy. (laughs) She's happy. It's all right. I have other brothers and sisters with very small world. One of my brothers moved to a town called Newcastle. He's been there ever since. Small minds. No no offense. I don't mean that, you know, badly. I just mean people are different. Do you know, for me... Living in two square miles for the rest of my life is not my idea of excitement. Have I got any company? 
I think there's a little bit more. I think I should be believing for something greater, seeing something more, and not being confined. But you know what? Some people are happy just with a tiny little existence. Some people's level of faith is so small, it's unbelievable. So small. And they make do. They, you know, stay small. They think small. They act small. Their faith is small. God help us. That's not you, right? That's not you, is it? Oh, come on. That's not you, is it? No, it is not you. It is absolutely not you. You're born again. And when you got, you know, born again, something happened to you. You came alive spiritually inside. And I want you to find that part. So many people born again and they act as if they're not. (laughs) Your spirit, guys. Your spirit, get in contact with the, the inner you. The part of you that God has created and made and shaped and planned. Today we're talking about taking action. Taking steps. Even if they're baby steps, the longest journey begins with the first step. Let me, let me put it like this. Every person in this room has got something that you should do that you're not doing. Every person that you've been saying to yourself, I should do that. One day I'm going to do that. I really, 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 really need to deal with that someday. Every person has something that they're not acting on. That they know, they, whether it's to go to someone and confront them. A colleague, a family member. To go and say, do you know what? I have had enough of this. And in your mind you say, one day I'm going to do that. One day I'm going to do the thing that bugs me, the thing that I know, one day, one day, one day. And if you're not careful, you'll be saying that till the day you die. Action is what it's about, friend. Action. Action. Not just talk, but actually doing stuff. Getting on with stuff. But people don't take action. Me and you, we're all the same. You are not taking action. You're not, you're not doing what you know you should do for a number of reasons. Maybe you say, if I say that to him, he won't like me. You're right. <laughs> but they, they don't like you now. Right? They don't like you now. So even if you do what you know you should do, it's, I mean, you're not going to be in a much different situation. But people don't take action because they want to be liked by everybody. It is not possible. True? It's not possible. And it's even less possible if you intend to do anything or be the person God has called you to be. So forget about the like me thing. Other people don't take the actions that they know they should take because they say, if I do this, I'm going to suffer loss. I'm going to lose someone. Well, maybe you need to lose someone. Maybe you're in a bad relationship. Amen. Amen. Maybe you need to lose a few people. Maybe you need to lose a few friends. And loss is not always bad news. Some good Losses have to take place. Some people drag people down for decades. And they never take the action that's necessary. Yes, you will suffer loss. If you take the appropriate steps. For other people, they don't act all their lives. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna. Maybe, you know, in some cases, it's just a lack of confidence. And that's where the church can come in. And you can receive that from God. He can change you. For other people, they don't act because maybe they haven't come to a crisis. And, and, and that is a, not a good way to live, I'm afraid. But it's a bit like the prodigal son. You know we have prodigal son types. The prodigal son required his life to be a disaster before he took 
action. And some people are like that. The situation has to get absolutely terrible before they ever rise up and say, I'm going to actually do something. So you are sitting on something this morning. Your hidden dream, where you're going, what you know God has called you to, to do, and something is stopping you from acting and taking the steps, and I want you to find it. I love the prayer on Tuesday nights. It's just such a, an honor to be there. Great ministry. Tuesday nights and Wednesday nights in here. Really, if you can get here, do so. So what, what I'm about to say has got nothing to do with not believing in prayer. I believe with all my being in prayer, and I will be there for the rest of my life. However, it doesn't mean you don't act. And for many people, prayer does become a hiding place. Oh, I'll just pray about it. You've been praying about it long enough. <laughs> Exodus chapter 14, verse 14. Moses didn't want to go to the battle. Remember? What was Moses doing? Praying. And what did God say? Didn't say shut up. <laughs> but he said, Moses, why are you crying out to me? Go into the battle. That's what you said you were going to do. Go and take action. So what is holding you back? I'm telling you folks, in terms of achieving the dream, achieving the vision, you cannot have a casual attitude to this. If you have a casual attitude, you're going to become a casualty. Yes, you are. That's what you're going to be, and you don't have to do that. Here's a question. When do Christians die? Don't answer. When do Christians die? I've done a couple of studies over the years because I had to do it for churches I was in about when is a baby born. Something very familiar with here. When is a baby born? There's a lot of legal debates about this with, against Christianity. You know, when, the, when is a baby conceived or whatever. When the water breaks, when the body comes out, when the head comes out, when the child first breathes. There's all sorts of arguments in court. Or when does a person die? Because there's brain death and then there's the heart stops and there's, you know, three minutes in between and all that kind of thing. But when does a Christian die? Some people believe a Christian dies the day their dream dies. The day that the very purpose of your being, the purpose of your being here and being created, the goal of God, when that's gone, pff, sad, isn't it? Sad. But you know what? I, I thank God that I can say this with all my heart and in full faith. I've got good news for you. <laughs> because it is never too late. Yeah, it is never, ever, 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 ever too late. I don't care this morning if you are 9 or 99. It is never, ever, 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 ever too late. It is not too late for you. But, but, no buts. But you don't understand. But, 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 no, not true. God Almighty can overcome every one of those problems in your mind right now. Oh, yes, he can. More than able. More than able. Not a problem. The problem's not God, never was. The problem's us, isn't it? God can help you. God will enable you to achieve that dream, whether that dream is big, in the eyes of men, I mean, or small. It doesn't matter. You can affect this planet. Remember the lady Jesus was sitting at the table, and this lady had a dream... That she would bless the Lord. Very small. Very simple. Nothing sensational. But she had a dream. That she would be able to press through and pour oil. Remember? Small thing. In the eyes of people. But she did it. And Jesus said, what this woman has done here today. Wherever the gospel is preached. This story will be told. Wow. Tiny little thing. How silly and insignificant it must have looked. But actually her dream had enormous effect. Are you following me? So don't get the wrong idea of big or small. That's not important. What's important is you becoming 
self-actualizing. Whatever it is God has birthed you for, and that you must realize for yourself and find within yourself. But, (laughs) this is a genuine but, I'm sorry. There are biblical hurdles that we see in the lives of the individuals in Scripture. There are problems, there are issues that each of them had to overcome. And you are not an exception to those problems. You also will have to gird yourself and face the future and face it with a certain degree of determination in order to to achieve what God has brought you into the world for. You're going to have to have a certain set of attitudes to take that first step, to begin to change so that you fit your dreams, so that you fit your calling. Amen. Amen. What are those attitudes we see in Scripture? What are those attitudes I want you to have? What needs to change? Well, number one, on your notes. I'm going to have to, if I'm going to fulfill my dream, I'm going to have to change my bad habits for good habits. We've all got habits, correct? We've all got habits. Every person has habits. Some of them are good. Some of them are bad. You know what they say? We form our habits and then our habits form us. And very often those habits, if they're bad habits, they will be forming you into a person you don't like. It just happens to be you. And that's not good. Because it's difficult to live with someone you don't like. And you can't get away from yourself. So be very careful of your habits. Bad habits destroy self-esteem. Destroy confidence. Bad habits will take you away from the plan of God. Good habits will build your inner self will build you towards the goal. So this is not irrelevant, anything but. I heard a definition of of self-esteem, and it's this. It is confidence or satisfaction in who I am or what I have become. Confidence or satisfaction in who I am or what I have become. But that comes out of my habits. It comes out of my daily rituals, whatever they might be. Let me give you some examples because I think it's important on this point that you confront yourself within. Example of good habit, bad habit. Number one, is your habit to break the commitments you make? Are you a commitment keeper or a commitment breaker? Is it your norm to say, I'll do this and then you don't do it? If that's your habit, that is a very not good habit. That is going to destroy any self-esteem within you. I've been running for about 10 years. I ran with my wife when she was well. We ran several years together, probably about five years together. And then she couldn't run anymore. But for the last four years, I guess, I've been running very seriously. And I've taken it up quite a notch. Um, I remember in, in Glasgow when I started to take on the task with very serious determination... I would always have a principle. And my principle is, if I'm leaving the house and I say I'm going to run 5, 10, 15, 20K, whatever it is, you do it. Because the commitment's to no one else but me. It's a commitment to myself. It's important. And I will never forget, one day, I I can't remember what it was, I set like 5K or whatever, and I left the house and I stopped at about 3 or something like that. Now, I wasn't injured. I just stopped. And I went home. As I look back, I thank God for that. Because I sat on my sofa and I felt rotten. I felt bad because I thought, I told myself that I was going to do 5K. And I've actually, the person I've let down is me. And I remember sitting there and making a decision that I have kept, by the way. All these years, I made a decision when I say to myself, because that's what I do. I set a target as I leave the house. It's on my phone, strapped to my arm. This is what I'm going to do. I will complete that. And by the grace of God, I've been able to keep that. Not keeping your commitments is very bad for you. It changes who you are. I mean, 
another example of what I mean by that. We're all born again here. We all have a Bible. We all love the Lord. We know God's moral standards. Let's, let's say you go into a shop and you give the woman a five pounds, but she gives you change from a tenner. Now, say the shop is busy or whatever, you know what I mean? And, and you can go and you can look back and say, oh, Oh, well, you know, I've worked in a shop. They have a little kitty thing. They make up the till at the end of the day. It's a big store. It's not going to be a problem. (laughs) Listen carefully. It probably won't be a problem for the girl on the till. Nor will it be a problem for the company. But it's a big problem for you. And the person who's going to change in that situation, that is going to negatively affect how I see myself. And if I do that once and twice and three times, if I compromise myself, I'm forming a habit. And that habit will form me into a person I don't like. And we become become miserable. So make a decision. If you're going to reach a goal, make a decision to keep your commitments to your own commitments. Because that's the root of self-esteem. Secondly, If you habitually aim low, and some people do this, all their lives they do it. In terms of their career, they go for something low. In terms of their education, they aim low. You guys are great at that. In terms of husband or wife, okay, I meant to say that. (laughs) Just keep moving. (laughs) They aim low, right? And that needs correction. You say, well, what are you doing and why? What is happening here? Your choices say a lot about you. But I'm, what, don't miss the point. Aiming low becomes a habit. It becomes a habit. And it starts to define you. It starts to create you. The problem is not people who aim high and miss. The problem is people who aim low and they hit it every time. Yeah, that is the problem. Once you get into the habit of, well, it's not for me, well, um, you know, and you're backing off from life, that is not the Christian model we see here in Scripture, is it? Not at all. The head and not the tail, correct? So get those eyes up to the hills and redefine that, whatever those habits are. Get a hold of them. Shape them. Keep your commitments to your own commitments. Aim high if you're not. Change that part of yourself. Thirdly, in terms of bad habits, stop talking yourself out of everything. Oh, so many people can do this, you know. God can give you a a direction, a word, and within 10 minutes, you have come up with a thousand reasons why I can't do it. You know, I tell you what, friends, I've been through a few battles in my life, okay? Okay. A few hard times, a few tough times with churches and all kinds of stuff. But I've learned one thing. (laughs) Not talking about Jesus Christ. He's closer than a brother. But I've learned this. You know my closest friend? is me. And if I don't speak positively about me, sometimes the only positive voice in the room is my own. And you're going to have to learn that. Because if you become like the naysayers... That's crazy. You need yourself. You, do you know which side I'm on? My side. Yeah. I'm fighting for my side. And many people have said to me, you know, I, how did you get through those eight years with Jeanette? And I don't tell people, but I'll tell you today. Um, I printed out three pages of biblical confessions that I thought promises in Scripture that I saw were things that I needed to get through that. And day after day, I would come back from the hospital, I would walk in my flat, and I would say, I am the salt of the earth. I can do all things through Christ. Sometimes people can't help you, you know. I promise you, there are some situations in life where the person you need is you. You need yourself. You need to believe in yourself. Self-confidence. God believes in you. God believes in you. So if you can't believe in yourself, at least believe in the faith that God believes in you. Right? Right, it's true, isn't it? Believe in the fact that He believes in you. He chose to save you. He has a plan. Raise your faith to His level. 
Stop talking yourself out of everything. Such a worldly way. Number four, in terms of bad habits, begin to learn to manage your own emotions. Emotions are habits. Emotions are are habitual responses to emotions. It's not the situation, friends. It is not the situation. Did you hear me? It's your habit. It is not the person. It's not the disaster. It's you. You know, on 9-11, they tell a fantastic story about an office block where all the people were in the room. And they, they were watching on the television how the, the towers were coming down. And somebody gave an explanation of the different emotional reactions to the Twin Towers. One man became very angry and started to bang his desk. Because he's angry. That's what he always does. Another woman started to go, she saw someone crying and she started to go over and comfort the person. Because that's what she always does. It's a habit. It's a response. Another person's confused and frightened. But you're always frightened. Frightened of everything. Automatic, built-in, habitual responses. And we blame the situation. No, look at yourself. That is built up over time and you need to take control of it. You need to get self-mastery. Self-control. And bring those things in under the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. If you don't do this, it's going to affect your ability to achieve the dream. Right. You have to deal with this. You have to face it. I've given you a few things there in terms of holistic health. I like that term, holistic health, because in reality, that's what we need to strive towards. Mental health. You know... Let me just finish the list. Mental health, physical health, emotional health, spiritual health, and social health. That I need, if I'm going to achieve <coughs> excuse me, anything in life, I need to take stock of all of these areas of my life and make a determination to fulfill them. <clears throat> Let me say this to you guys. Everybody listening? You need to spend more money on yourself than you have been doing. And all the ladies said? Hallelujah. You need to spend, you need to spend more money. Listen, what I mean is you need to spend, look at the list, mental health. What do you do to to advance yourself mentally? What courses do you take? What conferences do you go to? Okay, what do you do to advance yourself physically? You say you won't pay the gym membership or whatever it is. Your biggest investment is, it's you. And often that's the one that goes by the, by the wayside. Physical health, emotional health. Am I, am I even analyzing my emotional responses? Or are those responses going to take me out of the relationships I need? Like Solomon, right? What about my spiritual welfare in terms of holistic health? Or my social well-being? All of those are important. They are integral to your moving forward with all the facets of yourself. So that's the first point I would say. In terms of taking steps and moving forward, even if they're baby steps, that's fine. We take them. So change today your bad habits for good habits. Make, you know, take an account, make an analysis of how things have been and change. Second reason why people don't move forward and we need to remove it and we can do that is fear of failure. People are frightened of failure. How will I look? Oh, people will laugh or whatever it is. But do you know what? Everybody who did anything failed, didn't they? Oh yeah, every single person. There's no exceptions to this. And you need to get the mentality... To learn to fail your way to success. And accept it. I'm going to fail my way to success. And that's okay. If a job's worth doing, it's worth doing wrong. There we go. It's great, isn't it? Yeah. Do you know, that's a stupid statement, to be honest with you. 
But you know why? Because it's not, it's not, it doesn't lead you anywhere. Do you know what it should say? If a job's worth doing, it's worth doing badly until I can do it well. You didn't get it. Okay, go back over here. If a job's worth doing, it's worth doing badly until I get it right. Say, I was just saying, like, say the keyboard. Say you want to play the keyboard, but you know you can't. Well, sooner or later, you're going to have to step up there. Are you going to make mistakes? Yeah. But because you care about it, because it means something to you, you do it, even if it's badly. Do it badly until you do it goodly. It's a new word. (laughs) Praise the Lord. Learn to feel your way and accept yourself as you feel. See beyond the criticism of others. Don't let it penetrate. Don't let it in. You need to protect yourself. Your best friend is you. So, you know, banish these fears. Fear of failure. Who cares about failure? Secondly, people don't take steps because they say, I'm unable. That's right. You are unable. You're just like, you know, thousands and thousands of people before you. And they had a dream. They had a mission. They had a calling. And they also had to learn. Did I write that out? No, I didn't. I put put it on your notes. There are things that we must... uh, Let me put it like this. I don't know if you follow snooker. There's a world champion called Ronnie O'Sullivan. He's really annoying. Because he doesn't practice. And the other guys are practicing, practicing, practicing. And he comes in like wins. You know, there's always someone like that in school, isn't there? They don't study. And you have to study just to get close. Why did you make people like that, isn't it? <laughs> you, I, I, I warn you guys, there are exceptions. You prophesied it a few weeks ago. There are exceptions to the rule. I am not one of them. In any department, I am not, one, I'm not a Mozart who reached up and was composing. As a, I'm, 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 I'm not him. And probably, statistically, probability-wise, neither are you. Because there's not many of those guys. Most of those snooker players practice for hours. There's just a few guys who are able to do that. And probably you're not one of them. So whatever it is God gives you, whatever the dream is, look at the list I've given you, four points. You're going to have to get knowledge on that subject. So if it's life coaching, Evelyn, you soak yourself. You educate yourself. Soak yourself in whatever your dream is. Or mental health might. You soak yourself in that thing. Gain as much knowledge as you can get. Develop your skills. Don't take it for granted. And of course have faith in yourself. Even if others don't. And you have to be committed. You must be committed to seeing the thing through to fruition. Amen. Another reason people don't go fierce. Fierce. Fear of others. Fear of being hurt. That's a biggie, you know. You know, if you work for Asda, you're going to get hurt. If you work for Tesco's, you're going to get hurt. If you drive a taxi, you're going to get hurt. If you get married, you're definitely going to get hurt. (laughs) You're going to get... There is no hurt-free zone on this planet. It doesn't exist. Do you know what? You're hurt now. You're hurt now. You're hurt about something now. And all the the scheming in the world cannot free you from hurt. Sorry. So what you actually have is a choice of hurts. I can do A, I can do B, but either way I'm going to be hurt. And you need to choose in accordance with what the overall dream is from God. Years ago, I happened to be Somewhere, and I saw this document. I'm so glad I saw it. It was on the golfer, Sevi Ballesteros. He was worth millions and millions and millions. <clears throat> and he wanted to tell his story, but his story is very sad. But he wanted to tell it. He had bought himself or built himself this mansion on the beach. He bought a section of the beach. And, you know, the, 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 the documentary crew went in and they were talking to him. And he was explaining about his life, got married, got divorced, I don't know where she is now, got married again, got divorced, the three other kids there, I don't know where they are, don't talk to me. And it just went on and on 
about his sick. And what about the golf? Oh, yeah, the golf. It was so interesting, but so sad. And the documentary finished with him sitting with a bitter glass of whiskey, looking out on a boring sea, all on his own. And you just think, so a hundred million dollars can't protect you from hurt then. And don't, don't get the idea in your head that you're going to do stuff that's good. That's not a good plan because then when you get hurt, you'll pull back. Right? That's a mistake. Now, I believe there is hurt in the Christian walk. In fact, Jesus even promises it. Right? As they treated me, so they'll treat you. That's an important part of being able to stay the course. So you have to embrace that. Suck it up, as they say in the States, right? Accept it. It's called our cross. So people don't take the baby steps because they refuse to change their habits and then they despise even them very selves. They don't confront their fears. And there's a multitude of fears. That's just a few examples. Or thirdly, because they remain their entire lives frightened of the opinion of others. Heaven deliver me from fear of the opinions of others. Can you say amen? Amen. May God set me free from worrying about what people think about me. Or letting it affect me. Or letting it discourage me. You cannot live like that. You cannot do it. Okay? Don't do it. It's a mistake. It's a huge mistake. Don't let other people, if you get it from God, this is the important bit, anything you get from God, they can't affect you anyway. It's going to remain. It's a little pilot light inside. That's the key. That's the secret. Get your vision from the Lord. Nothing else matters after that. You can keep what you get from him. It will be secure inside you. But, you know, you probably see this in evangelism. When we train people in street work, you give them a bunch of tracks, you know. And they go out on the street. They say, do you want a track? And they're all happy. Do you want a track? No. Do you want a track? No. Do you want a track? No. And after a while, do you want a track? And I have seen this many times. Do you know what they end up doing? Tracks by their side. Thousands of people passing by. And they've just shut down. They've lost faith in themselves. Someone says, can I have a track? No, you don't want one. You know. (laughs) They've lost faith in themselves. They've lost confidence in what they were doing. They've lost confidence in the product. You can have the best product in the world. But if the salesman doesn't believe in it, right, it still won't sell. I mean, don't be deceived, guys. Do you you know what's happening there? The opinion of others. That's what's happening. Someone's being worn down and worn down and worn down repeatedly by other people's opinions. Because they don't want one. And you have to be prepared for that, if you like, to rise above it. In terms of the opinions of I, I don't want you to take the wrong perspective of it. Because there is a place for people in my life. There's a place for input into my life. If you remember what I said before, and it's a very important point. For me, on dreams, I don't need a pastor. What do I need? I need a mentor. There's a very big distinction there. Very big distinction. Countless millions of people around the world are stuck on this point. They're stuck and they don't know what's wrong. They're stuck behind their pastor who doesn't have the ability. He doesn't have the ability. He hasn't got it. And you need to find someone who has. But I want you to struggle to to articulate what I'm trying to say on this point, to be honest with you. Because I want to say you need people and you don't. (laughs) But actually, you need people at a certain point and then you don't. Human beings are different from every other creature. You know, when a fish, a little baby fish comes out of its mother, it swims away. Ready to go. Off it goes. And you look at kittens or dogs, just a few days, weeks, and they're gone. They're self-sufficient. Not so people. Right? Not so human beings. Human beings are born with a dependency. That's the way this is built. That's the structure. And so it is in the kingdom. When you're born again, you're also biblically created with a dependency. That you're supposed to come into nurturing. Come into the church. Be covered. 
right? Be sponsored. All of those things called discipleship. All of those things are very important. But listen to what I'm going to say next. That is phase one. That is phase one. And that's where your pastor really has a massive job to do. Now, in that phase, you may get a small dream, like I'm going to play the drums. You get a small dream. And with the help of others, go on, you can do it. You know what I mean? It's nurturing. But you don't stay there. Because other people are actually being the middleman. At a certain point, you have to get your own dream with you and God. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Oh, yeah. There's a different phase. It's a different stage where God needs to take you aside, you and him, and put something in you, and then you become the mentor. Oh, yeah, very quiet. This is a blockage. This is, a, I mean, a, 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 this is not milk, it's meat. But I'm telling you the truth. You need to learn to, to, number one, find that physical human mentor right now. Find them, pray for them. Pray for them, for God to identify your gift, and then you find he will give you someone. And then eventually you come into your own calling. That doesn't mean you're not out of cover. I don't mean that. I just mean there, there is a point of, of, sorry for the term, but self-actualization where you become the person God intended you to be. What I'm saying is it's your dream. It's your dream. It's your vision. It's yours. Uh, what way did I put it? Up? This is a quote from someone anonymous. The only opinion about your dream that really counts is yours. That's my point. And the negative comments of others merely reflect their limitations, not yours. Now, handle that with care, but you know what I'm trying to say. Turn your page over. Last point. And ultimately, this could be under fears as well, but ultimately the reason why people don't even take baby steps is because they're frightened of the unknown. 85% of people... On this planet, tomorrow morning, Monday morning, will be going to a job they don't want to do. 85%. Listen carefully. Listen carefully. They get up. I don't want to go here. I don't want to. But they would rather suffer that than take a step of faith. They would rather spend every day with a known pain than take a leap of faith To the unknown. Correct? Oh yes, it's correct. Even if it makes me sick, even if it's destroying me, even if it's taking my very life, I would rather know this thing I know than actually take a step of boldness, of vulnerability. I'm not going to do it. I'm just going to be like everybody else. But there's been many Christians before you. Many. Many. Thousands and thousands. And they also had a a fork in the road. They also had a choice. They also had bills. So don't talk to me about your bills. They had bills. They've all got bills. But they made a different choice. A choice based on faith. A choice based on vision. To be an uncommon people. A peculiar people. A different people. And if there's any criticism that can be made of the church today, it's that we look like everybody else. Act like everybody else. Who's an exception here? Do we have any exceptions here? Thank you. One. You need to start to see yourself. I am exceptional. I'm not going to do what they all do. Look at them anyway. Isn't it? Look at their lives. Is that what you want to emulate? Don't do it. Take a risk. Go on. Take a risk. Go on. Now, I know. I was in prayer in the last few weeks, and some of you are doing stuff. I know you're taking baby steps. Good. Good. Do it. Do it. Act. Don't let fear of the unknown. I put a little... Somebody in America did this years ago. I couldn't find it. But when Neil Armstrong... There was a guy in the, in the Apollo craft called Buzz Aldrin, and someone created a little word balloon over the craft, and it said, Hey, Neil... Don't take that step, man. You might slip, you know. And that's what it's like. As soon as you step out to do anything of significance, I promise you, there will be voices. I'm not sure if I would do that. And you need to prepare yourself ahead of time for that. Jesus. Look at this last, very, very, very last point. 
Human nature being what it is. People being what they are. And you're no exception. They very seldom do anything until they get to the place where they say, do you know what? I've had it. Whether it's in a relationship, whether it's in your family, your home, your job, your life, there has to be the breaking point, the frustration point that each person must get to. Where it's over, that's it, no more. And I, if you are not there, if you have not arrived at that place, you need to pray. The day has to come when you say, I have had it with what I've been since I was 10 years old. And please listen to me. Some of you are still doing the things now that your parents told you when you were 12. Yeah, isn't it true? We get on a track in life. We go down a career path. And before you know it, you're 50. Amen. (laughs) What just happened? Life. Life. And if you don't lead your life, life will lead you. And it's probably going to lead you somewhere you don't want to go. But some people, and I hope there's some of them here this morning, some people get to the point where they say, do you know what? I've had it with this. I have had it with this. I'm going to be that exception. I'm going to be different. And I'm going to make a start whatever that might be mean. Will you do that? Was that convincing, Richard? (laughs) Jesus. God help us. God help you. God help you. You know, when I think of the last 20, 30 years and three years time, I'll have been full time 30 years. When I got saved, I told you I had a speech impediment. Ah, oh, Jesus. I was in a church. Ba, 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 boo, boo, ba, 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 ba. Not tongues. Speech impediment. <laughs> I was hiding. Because I was supposed to preach. And I can't even talk. And I will never forget that day. I'll never forget that day. Because I was walking, what do I do, what do I do? I've had it with this feeling. Yeah, I've had it. And we went, actually went outside Tesco. And I did it very badly. <laughs> it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. But that opened the door. To the, I honestly see that to this day. When I took that little step, I had no comprehension of what was ahead for the next 27 years. This year. I had no idea. I could still be in social services pushing a pen behind a desk. And some of you are the same. And that's not critical of any profession. God bless you. I'm just saying you can be made for greater things. And there's plenty of people can do your job. Plenty. But where are the Christians? Huh? Where are the believers? My wife used to say that all the time. We're surrounded by believers, believers who don't believe. Yeah. Look, we're surrounded by believers who don't believe in anything. What are you believing in? I mean personal, very personal day to day. What are you believing in for yourself? No problem. Go back to the start of this with five bits. They're all important. Finding that dream is important. You get it from God. Not from people, from God. Invite the worship team. Richard, would you pray for us? Just take a moment, folks, as the team take their place. You take a moment. Thank you. As the worship team take their place. Can you please be on our feet this morning, this afternoon? The word of God has come to us today. I know we all had different bits that applied to us. So this afternoon, I want to give you an opportunity to lift up your hands to God. If that is your desire, because God says he will grant us the desires of our heart. And pray this afternoon that God will come through for you. 
give you the ability to overcome in the name of Jesus. If, it, if your life has been taken over by fear, you want to pray. Because the Bible says he has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of sound mind. Fear of the unknown. You want to pray this afternoon and say, God, touch me. God, touch me in the name of Jesus. There are stories of many people in the word of God who were afraid. And when they had an encounter with God, their lives got transformed. There are many of us here that are afraid of what people will say about us and prevent us from being what God wants us to be. You want to pray and say, God, help me in the name of Jesus. This afternoon, I want you to make it personal. Reflect and pray in the name of Jesus. That is about you and where you want to go in God. In the mighty name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Father, this afternoon we call upon you. Because your word says when we call unto you, you will answer us. Your word today has come unto us, O oh God. That you want us to be who you have called us to be. Because your word says you have a, a, an end for us. You have a purpose for us. Father, we have realized, O oh God, the things that withhold us. The things that prevent us from being where you want us to be. This afternoon we cry unto you, O oh God, that you will cause us to overcome. In the name of Jesus. Father, for some of us that need help, we pray for divine, O oh God. Help us. We pray, oh God, that you will send in divine helpers that will support us, oh God, to propel ourselves to where you want us to be. For us that have been consumed in fear and in anxiety, in the expectations of men and what society tell of us, this afternoon we call on you and say, God, touch us in the mighty name of Jesus. Redeem us, oh God, from our fears and our anxieties. Cause us to remember what your word says, oh God, that you have not given us the spirit of fear but of power and of sound mind. In the name of Jesus, this afternoon we call on to your God for heavenly touch. In the name of Jesus. Father, for some of us that have been caught, oh God, in a dead job, we pray for the ability to let go. In the name of Jesus, whatever that has become an obstacle, that is preventing us, oh God, from walking in the purpose and in the destiny of God for our lives. This afternoon we reject it in the name of Jesus. We pray, God, that you will cause us, oh God, to where you want us to be in the mighty name of Jesus. We lift our hands to you as a sign of surrender. Your word says, Oh God, if you call unto you, you answer us. Yes, Lord, there are many things in your word that says you have given us all things that pertain to life and godliness. This afternoon, we pray for an awakening, oh God, in our spirit. Cause us, oh God, to overcome. Cause us to stand still in the name of Jesus. That your name will be glorified in our lives. You have brought us here, God, for such a time as this for a purpose. We pray God that we will not just be hearers of your word but we will be doers of that which you have told us today. You are calling us oh God into our purposes and to our destiny. We pray God that as you have given us all things, cause us oh God to rise up. Voices that speak negative unto us, we come against it today. In the name of Jesus. Father as you said let my people go, so do I pray this afternoon. Let there be a release in this house. We send destiny help us oh God into the life of everyone that will touch us oh God to be where you want us to be in the mighty name of Jesus